New York has reported the first U.S. case of polio in nearly 10 years. Let's break it down. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I've been studying viruses, particularly polio virus, for over 40 years. To understand this case of polio found just this week, we need to go back to a little history and a lot of biology. On July 21st, New York State Department of Health uh, reported a case of polio in a Rockland County resident. Here is the Department of Health uh, press release. This individual was determined to have polio bias by sequencing of uh, most likely a, a fecal sample uh, and was confirmed by the CDC. And it looks like it was a vaccine-derived polio virus that caused his polio, specifically a Sabin type 2 vaccine. And uh, the significance of this will be uh, clear in a bit, but this means that this individual got that virus uh, from someone else either here in the U.S. or uh, in another country. Now, here is the uh, location of Rockland County, in case you don't know. Uh, here's New Jersey. This is the northeast part of New Jersey, Bergen County. Here's Rockland County right here. That's the border between uh, New Jersey and and New York, and there is Rockland County uh, outlined in red, west of the Hudson River, not too far from where I grew up here in, in Bergen County. And here, just for uh, reference, is Manhattan, which is where I am at this time uh, as I record this. So the, near, the Washington Post reported on this yesterday. As I'm recording this, it's July 22nd. Here was the headline, New York reports the first U.S. polio case in nearly a decade. And yesterday they said an unvaccinated young adult recently contracted polio. So that's another important point here. The individual was unvaccinated, lives in Rockland County, developed symptoms a month ago, did not recently travel outside of the country. Now today, the article is revised. And it now says, while the origins of the case are still being investigated, the 20-year-old man... So now we know the age and the sex, had traveled to Poland and Hungary this year and was hospitalized in June. He was originally thought to have acute flaccid myelitis and inflammation uh, of the spinal cord and brain. Uh, but then subsequent testing, which means they took a stool sample from him most likely uh, and did genome sequencing, they found that it was in fact poliovirus that indicates transmission from outside the United States. Uh, so the patient has been discharged, living at its parents' home. He's able to stand, but is having difficulty walking. Of course, all of this could be prevented, could have been prevented by uh, using polio vaccine. But let's go back in history to understand what's going on here. For the, those of you who might not be uh, familiar with poliovirus, poliomyelitis, and vaccine-derived polio. Now, polio is an old human disease. Here is an Egyptian carving from thousands of years ago, which shows a, a priest with a drop foot. And this is because a polio virus causes paralysis, flaccid paralysis, where the muscles can't be moved. So the foot drops. Normally, if you pick up your leg, you can keep your foot horizontal. But if you're paralyzed in the leg muscles, you cannot. And so you also see atrophy of the calf because as you don't use the muscles, uh, they shrink. Over the years, you can find reports of cases of polio in the historical records. They're very rare. They are sporadic, but they appear to be uh, what looks like poliomyelitis. So poliomyelitis has been a human disease for many thousands of years, maybe even longer. It clearly came at some point from another animal. We don't know when that happened. We don't know which animal. Its origins are obscure. However, on the right, this graph shows you that around the turn of the 1900s, the beginning of the 1900s, the number of cases of polio began to increase. So you can see annual reported cases here on the y-axis. And you can see suddenly outbreaks of thousands and thousands of cases until 1916, the big outbreak in the U.S. Uh, where there were many, many thousands of cases in the Northeast, in particular New York City. 
And all these outbreaks brought our attention to poliovirus, the causative agent of the disease. So poliomyelitis is caused by a virus. So poliomyelitis is the name of the disease, the paralysis that occurs uh, when you are infected with this virus. It's a small virus as viruses go. It's about 30 nanometers in diameter. Here on the left is an electron micrograph. In the middle is a schematic of the structure of the virus. It's made up of four proteins repeated 60 times each. And the shell encases the genomic material, which for poliovirus happens to be RNA, and it's plus-stranded RNA. And you can see in this schematic on the right, this is the actual structure of the virus particle, a very thin shell that covers the RNA genome. So the virus was identified in 1906. Shortly thereafter, people began to work on developing vaccines for the disease because it was a substantial cause of disease, paralysis in particular, and sometimes death in children. And so uh, we wanted to make a vaccine. A vaccine was not developed, however, until the 1950s. Now, how do you get polio? Uh, polio virus is acquired by what we call fecal oral contamination. You ingest something that is contaminated with someone else's fecal material, and that fecal material contains the virus. So this is not a virus that is transmitted by respiratory droplets like influenza virus or SARS-CoV-2. It, it is an orally transmitted virus. You swallow the virus. It goes through your stomach into your intestines where the virus then begins to reproduce in the cells lining the intestine, which we call the mucosal cells. And uh, the virus then reproduces uh, in the intestines to very high levels. You shed it in your feces, and that's how you could infect someone else. So you can shake hands with someone who has just been to the bathroom and didn't wash their hands very well. Children are very prone to not having good hand hygiene. So that's how the virus is transmitted. Uh, the virus then is shed in large quantities, as I said, but it also makes its way into the bloodstream. Uh, and then in, in certain individuals, it can get into the spinal cord and brain where it reproduces in neurons, which control muscle movement. Now, interestingly, only 1% of infections end up having paralysis, one in 100 or so. So 99 out of 100 people who are infected with polio have either no illness at all, at all or a minor illness, and only one out of 100 is paralyzed. Um, and... We don't understand why that is. We suspect that those individuals who are, who are paralyzed have some genetic predisposition to uh, becoming paralyzed. So that is what we call the pathogenesis, how polio virus causes uh, disease. Uh, the virus, as I said, makes its way into the spinal cord and brain, and it reproduces in motor neurons. These are these large cells that are green here. It destroys them, and if you destroy enough motor neurons, you can't move your arm or your leg any longer. So the human is the only reservoir for the virus, very different from uh, other viruses, influenza viruses where water birds are the main reservoir. We are the only known reservoir. We're the only uh, animals that seem to be infected. Uh, it is, as I said, spread by fecal oral transmission, and it peaks during warm months in temperate climates. So it's a seasonal virus during the U.S. when we had many, many outbreaks uh, mainly, they occurred in the summertime. And so the fact that it only occurs in humans makes it eradicable. And the WHO is on a campaign, which has lasted for many years, to eradicate the disease and the virus, in fact. And they're doing very well, as I'll show you uh, in a bit. In the U.S., this is the n number of cases of polio from about 1940 onwards. So the, on the y-axis, reported cases per 100,000 population and time on the x-axis. And you can see the number of cases peaked in the 1950s. Uh, there was a large increase in the number of cases post-World War II. These are the baby boomers uh, born to service men and women coming back from the war who had children. And that gave rise to a very large susceptible population and, and tens of thousands of cases of paralytic disease every year. And many of those individuals remained paralyzed for, for much of their life, although some could be uh, recovered by therapy. Uh, in 1955, the inactivated vaccine of Jonas Salk was introduced. That brought down the number of cases substantially. And then in 1961-62, uh, the oral vaccine developed by 
Albert Sabin, was introduced, and we had our last indigenous case of polio virus in 1979. Now, what does that mean? Indigenous means that the last case caused by cir caused by circulating viruses, which we call wild type. That is viruses, polio viruses found in nature. And you may say, well, what about this past case? Well, well, I'll tell you why that is not an indigenous case in a minute. Uh, so Jonas Salk's polio vaccine, the inactivated vaccine or IPV, uh, comprises three serotypes. So there are three different types of polio viruses, type 1s, 2, and 3. If you are infected with type 1, you're not going to be protected against the other two against disease. So we made a vaccine with all three serotypes. So it's a trivalent vaccine. Jonas Salk treated all three serotypes with formalin to destroy their infectivity. Uh, and this was tested in a very large clinical trial in 19, in the early 1950s uh, of 1.8 million children. Huge. A single clinical trial. Biggest ever done. And it showed over 50% protection and was licensed on April 12th, 1955. And these are some of the headlines in the major newspapers of the time showing uh, the vaccine results. And you can see that polio was a big deal uh, back then. The IPV works by causing your body to make antibodies against the virus. And those antibodies circulate in the blood so that if you ingest virus at some point, after you've been immunized, the virus will reproduce in your intestines. It will make its way to the blood, but there the antibodies will block its ability to further reproduce and it will block its ability to cause polio. So very important point, inactivated polio vaccine does not prevent reproduction of the virus in the intestines. And many countries now are, are using an activated polio vaccine. Now, in, as I said, in 1961 too, we switched using, from using IPV in the US to using OPV, and OPV is an infectious virus. Now, here's how OPV was made by Albert Sabin. He took the three serotypes of polio virus, the wild polio virus serotypes, and he passed them. He grew them in various ways in animals, in cells, in culture. And each passage, he did hundreds. He asked, am I reducing the ability of this virus to cause paralysis? In other words, he was reducing the neurovirulence of the virus. And in the end, he derived three types which were uh, not able to cause paralysis in experimental animals like non-human primates. They were tested in humans in, in very big clinical trials, initially in the Soviet Union, and then licensed in the U.S. in 1961. So we switched from inactivated vaccine to the o OPV, the oral polio vaccine, in 1961. How these vaccines work is different from IPV. You ingest OPV, you drink it, as opposed to IPV, which is injected in your muscle. The virus goes into your intestine, it reproduces in the intestine, it gives you antibodies in the mucosal layer. It gives you secretory antibodies, and then the virus gets in the blood, and it also induces antibodies there as well. So if an OPV immunized person uh, ingests poliovirus sometime after being immunized, the virus will not reproduce very well in the intestine. It's not, not sterilizing. It doesn't block entirely reproduction. But after a few days of memory response, the antibodies in the intestine will reduce the amount of virus and consequently block invasion of the CNS, and it blocks poliomyelitis. But even OPV immunized people shed uh, a certain amount of virus. In particular, they shed vaccine virus for uh, maybe months after immunization. And if they are encountering wild virus, they will shed a small amount of that as well. So that virus was, that vaccine was introduced in the U.S. in 1961, and it has eliminated uh, polio from the U.S. Uh, now, Along and many other countries, by the way. Now, al along with its control of polio came a problem. Uh, and this was first discovered uh, by sequencing the genomes of Sabin's vaccine strains in the 1980s. Here are the three serotypes of the Sabin vaccines. And these are mutations in the genome in various regions. These mutations are what are responsible for preventing the virus from paralyzing you. So we call them attenuating mutations. And you can see there are very few here in type 1, there is a 5' prime untranslated region change, and then there are a few in the capsid protein coding sequences. We have another one in the 5' prime UTR of type 2, and a single capsid 
protein change, and then one in the 5' prime UTR of type 3, as well as a capsid protein sequence. So all three have a change in the 5' prime untranslated region. So what does that mean? So here's the viral RNA, which is the genetic material for poliovirus, 7,440 bases in length. Uh, at the 5' prime end, there is a, an untranslated region of about 740 bases, which is not translated into protein. The, the coding region is the remainder of the genome. And here's the untranslated region expanded. And here on the right is where Sabin's vaccine viruses have changes in the 5' prime untranslated region. One, serotype one, serotype two, and serotype three, all in a, in a very small part of this 5' prime untranslated region. And those changes are very important for reducing the ability of the virus to cause paralysis. Now, the problem arose in that we learned in the 1980s as we were sequencing these vaccine strains and sequencing the vaccine strains excreted by kids who were immunized that these changes go away. They do what we call reversion in genetic terms. But these mutations are lost and therefore the viruses acquire their ability to cause paralysis. So here's one of the first studies done in 1985 by a child in the United Kingdom who was immunized in the first year of life. And then we're looking at the base at 472. So 472, if we go back here, is the base that's changed in the type three vaccine. In the wild type virus, which causes paralysis, it's a C. In the vaccine, it's a U. And this child received the Sabin vaccine, which has a U at 472. And at 24 hours, the, the child's feces contains virus with a U. At 31 hours, it still has a U. But at 35 hours, less than two days after taking the vaccine, the child is now excreting virus with a mix of U and C. So the C is the wild type base. And then at 47 hours, about two days after immunization, all the viruses, the type 3 viruses the child is excreting have a C at this position. And these viruses in animal and non-human primates uh, are neurovirulent. They cause paralysis and destruction of the neurons in the brain. And so this experiment has been repeated with many other children and with other serotypes. And changes always occur in every individual who receives Sabin polio vaccine, within a few days, these attenuating mutations revert. It's amazing that it's not actually dangerous for most children who receive the vaccine. However, in the beginning of the 60s, when we licensed the Sabin vaccine in the U.S., we began to see cases of polio that were caused by the vaccine, and that's shown in this graph. So here we're looking at number of paralytic polio cases on the y-axis. The line is the total number of polio cases in the U.S., total paralytic polio. You can see uh, with the introduction of the Sabin vaccine, it's decreasing until it gets very low, and then the bars are what we call vaccine-associated polio. In other words, the vaccine can cause polio in one out of 1.4 million doses of vaccine given to kids. And that's because these bases are reverting, as I told you, as the viruses reproduce in the gut. And you can see these bars indicate the number of vaccine-associated polio cases, which ranged anywhere from 25 to 10 in some years fewer. And at one point, after 1979, the last indigenous case of indigenous polio caused by wild type virus you can see that right there it was an outbreak in pennsylvania the only polio we saw every year was caused by the vaccine and so the public health service at one point said all right the risk of polio uh, getting polio from wild type sources uh, now is minimal the, the vaccine is more of a risk so in the u.s we switched to ipv inactivated polio vaccine in 2000 and of course there are no more vaccine associated cases because the uh, inactivated vaccine doesn't reproduce in you and it doesn't revert so in the u.s and in a number of other countries we continue we continue to use ipv inactivated vaccine but other countries in particular those uh, where vaccine is is provided by who we still use opv now here's this current situation with polio globally. This is from a wonderful website called polioeradication.org, uh, which tracks all the cases of polio. And this is uh, global wild-type polio and vaccine-derived polio cases for the previous 
12 months. So first of all, types two and three wild type polio have been eradicated. We haven't seen those for years. They, they don't appear to be circulating. There's only a little bit of type one in Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, and more recently, we had a couple of cases in Mozambique and Malawi in Africa, unfortunately. But for many years, the, these two countries uh, were the only sources of type one polio virus. And you can see the numbers here are quite low. The reason there continues to be type 1 polio in those countries is because we can't get in uh, to vaccinate. And Mozambique and Malawi vaccination rates drop and you have an outbreak. But look at all these uh, green dots. And these are mainly in Africa, but also in a few other countries. These are caused by circulating vaccine-derived type 2. And these occur in these countries because they let immunization rates drop below 90%. These vaccine-derived strains circulate extensively in populations. They can circulate for many months. And if your vaccination rates drop, uh, then you're going to have an outbreak of polio. And that's what's happened here. So the vaccine-derived viruses are causing the outbreaks. And we also have vaccine-derived uh, type 3 and vaccine-derived type 1. So uh, uh, currently, uh, we are mainly immunizing against uh, type 1 and 3. We removed type 2 from the vaccine to try and get down these numbers of uh, type 2 derived cases. The problem is whenever there's an outbreak, we go back in with OPV because it's really good at start stopping an outbreak, but it reintroduces OPV type 2 uh, into the region. And so this is the source of circulating vaccine derived polioviruses. Many countries in the world that continue uh, to use that vaccine. Now, as you recall, uh, last month, there was a report of poliovirus in London sewage. Why is that? Well, the UK, like the US and a number of other countries, have switched to IPV. IPV doesn't immunize your gut. So if someone comes into the country, the UK is only using IPV. The US is only using IPV. If someone comes into the country that has been infected with a vaccine-derived virus, they will shed it into the sewage and uh, perhaps infect others. If you're immunized with IPV, you are not immune to infection with poliovirus. The, the vaccine does not immunize your gut. Hence, you can be infected. In the UK, they do routine surveillance for a virus, poliovirus in the sewage, and they pick this up. Uh, here in the US, we don't do routine surveillance. Uh, if we did, I, I suspect we would see uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses here in the US. And again, the problem is, is if anyone is not immunized against poliovirus and that individual in Rockland County was not immunized, they could be infected by these vaccine-derived strains. So that's the problem. So what's the solution? As long as poliovirus circulates, everyone needs to be vaccinated. There are no exceptions. You saw in Africa, if countries allow immunization to drop, they will have outbreaks of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. But which vaccine? If you keep using OPV, you will reintroduce those viruses. So a preference would be to use IPV. So here in the U.S., they're offering IPV to uh, individuals uh, in Rockland County. That's what we're using in this country. And you should be immunized because you don't want to be paralyzed. You don't want to be losing your limb function. But most of the world is still using OPV, and that's a problem. So there are two solutions to that. One, we could switch globally to IPV. It's not so simple because IPV has to be delivered by a needle, and vaccine delivery by needle is, is problematic. You need someone who, who knows how to use a needle. You need needles that are clean and are not going to spread any other infectious diseases. Uh, taking a vaccine by mouth is beautiful. It's very easy to deliver, and it's cheaper. So a strain of type 2 OPV has recently been developed called NOPV2 or new OPV2, which we think has less ability to revert during replication in the intestine. This is currently being given to many people, and maybe that's a solution uh, to the problem. But if that doesn't work, we're going to have to give everyone IPV until these vaccine-derived strains stop circulating. So that's what happened here in the U.S. The, this individual was not uh, immunized at all, and so he was susceptible to infection with a vaccine-derived type 2 strain that, mo of course, came from another country because we don't use OPV anymore. And the extent of circulation of these vaccine-derived strains uh, in the U.S. is unknown. We should be looking in sewage. We're looking in sewage for SARS-CoV-2. The same samples could be used to look for poliovirus and get an idea 
of how much virus there is. And you may ask, well, why do we need to do that? We should just immunize everyone. Well, obviously, uh, asking people to get immunized doesn't work. And maybe if we tell them, oh, there's poliovirus here, you should be immunized, maybe that will be an incentive. So we're in an unusual situation. Right now, in most countries, we are vaccinating against the vaccine. Right, So the vaccine, OPV, has been great to eliminate polio, but now it is the problem. And we need to, uh, some, we need to protect us against it by vaccinating and eventually get away from it. If you want to learn more virology, virology is an amazing field uh, that I've been doing for 40 years. I love it, but you should, you realize now that viruses are important to human health. I have virology lectures online, which you can find there on YouTube. And also I do a weekly, bi-weekly, two episodes a week uh, podcast called This Week in Virology. And so you should, you might be interested in checking them out. Those are the links. Thanks for listening. See you next time.